super special announcement here on Thursday, 11th of October 2018. The Business of Architecture UK will be having its next live event at UNI offices at 7A Hoek Place. We will be having a live panel discussion with some of the UK's leading architect, entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders where we will be discussing making money, profit, cash flow and impactful architecture. Now, early bird tickets have just gone on sale. They are at 50% below your regular price and you can get the link which will be in the info section of this podcast. So those are only going to be at the early bird 50% sale price for a few weeks. So make sure that you go and book your place now. Really committing to learning about finances and money systems, this will allow better design, more creativity and more freedom in your life and in your business. Business of Architecture UK, episode 20. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK, I'm your host Ryan Willard and this week we shall be going into part two of the live recording that I did a few weeks back for the webinar, the 10 most costly business mistakes that architects make when running a practice. So without further ado, we'll get straight back into where we left off. So number six, selling features and benefits, not the problem you solve. So I think this is a little bit of a a hangover from the long extended periods of time that we uh, spend in academic environments where we get very rigorously trained to sell architecture and design and then we even develop a very bespoke, nuanced vocabulary where we talk about architecture which is almost indecipherable to anybody else and it, it doesn't really work when we're trying to sell um, things to our market, to our audience. Selling architecture is something architects get criticized a lot for. And I think a good example is when you look at uh, most architects' websites, they are often designed for other architects. Um, They are kind of very minimal text. Then you have kind of very abstract photographs of a beautiful um, concealed gutter detail, which are absolutely, you know, they're fantastic, they're beautiful. But that's not necessarily what your client or the person who's going to be paying your fees is interested in. And this can be such a massive problem because by by selling the features of your architecture, um, you know, selling all the sort of detailed BIM technology that you use and, um, you know, the, the technical benefits of what it is, you're not understanding what the client's problem is first. And this can end up costing you thousands of hours of wasted meetings and wasted times. And selling the features is also very expensive for you as a business owner because it can mean that thousands of pounds worth of marketing materials can end up being wasted because you're not focusing on what the problem is that you solve of your client. And by when you start selling to what the client's problem is, you'll shorten your closure time, you'll be able to close deals faster, Um, you'll be able to focus more on your target clients, and most importantly, you can raise your fees, because you're really understanding what the client wants. There's a great quote here from uh, David Sandler, people buy emotionally, then they justify their decisions intellectually. And again, when we start looking at what a client's real problems are and often a client will come to you with a certain problem they might ask you um, you know I need more light and space and then you can start talking to them about all the different ways that you can make more light and stay space but with a little bit more probing and questioning and getting to what the emotional driver is you can start finding out that there are very many different reasons to why your client is wanting to um, uh, to do a building project I remember once I was, I was talking to a, a, a client and she said to me, you know, we want more light and space in the, in the house. Uh, and I was like, okay. And, I, and then I asked her, what was, what's, the most, what's the worst thing that could happen in this project for you? And she said, well, the worst thing that would happen would be if we didn't get planning. And I was like, okay, well, why is getting planning so important to you? And she said, well, 
if I don't get planning, then we won't be able to have the house exactly the way that I want it. And I asked again, why is it so important that you have the house exactly the way you want it? And she said, well, I just want to make it, you know, mine and it's got my own stamp. And I said, apologies if I'm asking really silly questions, but why is it really important for you to have, to have your own personal stamp on it? And she said, well, the house at the moment is filled with, you know, my husband's ex-wife all over it. And I was like, ah, okay. That was the real emotional driver behind this entire project. So being able to ask why and get into the conversation and find out what your client's pains are is really, really important. I love the um, Mies van der Rohe quote, never talk to a client about architecture. Talk to him about his children. That is simply good politics. He will not understand what you have to say about architecture most of the time. And I think that's, it's, it's really, really a, a nice way of understanding that when you start looking for what the client's problem is, when we can develop a better relationship and we can sell to that problem and we can add more value, essentially. So a little exercise that I would suggest is that just start speculating. Write down what are your client's biggest pains. Then actually go and ask your clients what are their biggest concerns or their problems um, or worries about doing an architecture project or what were the most sort of scary things for them. And then ask them also, see what the differences between those two things are. And then ask them also what they like best about their service, about your service rather. Because that's a really interesting question because sometimes a client might say, you know what, we really like the fact that you just took over um, in the final construction stage and you looked after everything. And as an architect, we might overlook that and be like, oh, well, that's just what we do. But actually you de-stressed the whole process for the client and it was a lifesaver. So you can actually start selling, you know what, I'll make this process no stress. That's what a client wants. They don't want the stress. So start asking why. Number seven. Let's have a little drink of water. Number seven. Mistakes that architects make Working for free. Now, it sounds kind of stupid almost. Well, of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work for free. But many of us don't realize when we're actually working for free. Um, many architects will do long consultations for free, give away free advice, um, travel long distance to see prospects that haven't been qualified, that are not suitable, and are just going to be there asking for lots of free advice. Competitions are something where I think they can be really, really valuable marketing assets. Um, and if done correctly and done within a, um, a, a good business plan, uh, competitions can work. But again, it tends to be the larger businesses that have got the resources behind them that can really make competition entries work. So competitions, I think, a, a, a lot of care needs to be taken. I, I saw a competition recently for one of the big museums here in London. Somebody invited me to uh, enter it, and me and a, a friend of mine who's an artist, we were looking through it, and we, like, we loved the brief, really exciting. And then you start getting into the more details of what they were requiring, and it was a huge amount of delivery work. They were looking for fire escape routes, and, and I was like, hold on a minute, how much, what's the, what's the prize fee? And it was something very small. And I was kind of like, my goodness, even if we do win the competition, we're not in a position um, to be able to uh, negotiate our fees. And that's, you know, we've got to really, really look at that. Would this be a good, you know, would this work as marketing? What happens if you don't win? Well, the competition entries just get put in an archive. No one's going to see them. What are the, what's the chances of you actually winning? So all these types of things need to be looked at and architects really need to be really like a lawyer with your time. Really, really kind of, it's precious and it's highly, highly valuable as well. Uh, and not, and by doing this, by doing too much of these free activities, particularly with prospecting, can really, really damage a business in the long run. Uh, I'll give a little example of somebody who did do some work for free and it was part of a bigger business strategy, was me, um, Alex Michaelis of Michaelis Boyd. Um, they designed the Soho 
house bar in um, in Soho in London, and they knew the uh, they knew the owners of the company. The company was kind of just starting out, and they the partners got together and they were like, you know what, this bar, this members club is going to be a place, a kind of you know of where all our ideal clients are going to be hanging out. So if we do this small project, it's going to be right in front of uh, loads of our target wealthy clients after they've had a few drinks as well. Um, and they put up a little system as, in place as well so the bartenders knew who the architect was and they were often in the bar themselves frequenting it. And it grew into lots of other private work. They won loads of jobs out of, out of that, at that conversation starter. Um, and they also ended up designing bigger and larger parts of Soho houses, which have all, you know, they've, that, that, comp that brand has expanded across London and across the globe now. So, a little exercise, audit, have a look, where are you working for free? Really be ruthless with this and look at what tasks you're doing, look at where you're discounting work. And I know this can be a very difficult one sometimes, particularly if it's family or friends. You know, look at where you're discounting, look at where you're working for free. And things like where you, you, you don't charge like for consultations or for advice, look at creating something like a low-cost consultation or an LCC. Um, a small little taster, a kind of, you know, maybe, maybe it's a few hundred quid, a few kind of ideas or types of things, you know, a bit of a planning, some planning research and package that into something very valuable for a client um, and use that as a way, you know, all this work that you're not getting paid for can end up turning into, you know, two, three hundred quid a pop, even if I know, I know many people who charge more for larger LCCs. Number eight. So, I think this is my probably my favourite one, uh, and it's complaining. Um, and I, I really do think complaining is a silent killer of architectural businesses and architectural careers. Uh, and it complaining is a fast track to being broke, to being tired, to being exhausting. Complaining will rob you of the vital energy that you need to succeed in your business. Complaining actually, I think, acts like a subconscious repellent to potential buyers, to clients, investors. And if you ever heard Gary Vaynerchuk um, speak, he's really aggressive about people who complain. Uh, I think one of the quotes is that you, know, you can cry, but you're just going to lose. There's no space for complaining in the business arena. So stop it. And I, I think... Stopping complaining, it sounds obvious and it sounds really easy, but complaining has a way of disguising itself. It has a way of masquerading as, uh, you know, of good in, as good intentions. It can be very insidious, it can be very subtle, but it ultimately robs you of taking responsibility um, for, your, for your business and for your life, for your financial goals, uh, and can be really very, very corrosive and destructive force. Um, if you ever come across the work of Werner Erhard or the Landmark Forum, their programs and seminars go in depth about complaining and they call it a racket. And they use this idea that in the US in the prohibition era, you would have a, um, like a false company on the street, like a laundrette uh, that was operating and people would go in there and do that. But actually behind the scenes in the back room, they were making uh, alcohol and selling it. And it's this idea of that a, uh, that a racket is actually a, a guise, it's covering up, a complaint is covering up something more sinister. And it's normally com covering up some form of us not wanting to take 100% responsibility for, where, for the results that we're producing and the circumstances that we're in. So a little exercise is list all your complaints. List all your complaints um, about business and just drop them down, see which ones. You're probably quite familiar with them. And then ask your friends or a business partner or the best person to ask would be your wife or spouse or significant other and ask them, do I complain or what is it that I complain about? Now that is, will be quite reflective. Uh, and ask yourself the question, what is the impact of this complaint and where is it stopping me? 
So number nine, lack of funding, lack of resource. So, so many small businesses go under and I was reading the other day, the biggest killer of businesses is there just not being a market need for what your business is providing. And the second is just lack of resource, lack of funding, lack of time, lack of people, lack of innovation. Um, and many of us, when we start a business, we seriously underestimate how long it will take and how much money is needed to start and run a business. Um, I was looking at a, a thing on Cora, I think it was the other day, and somebody had very articulately looked, at, broken down into a list of four things here of, of resources that any company needs. Land, number one, land, number two, wage, number three, entrepreneur, and number four, capital. And in terms of what he means by land, it means you know, the raw materials. What are the raw materials required to establish the business for it to perform well in achieving its attended goals? Wage. A lack of a wage or no wage system will not attract. You're not going to retain a good employees. You're not going to be able to elevate yourself and perform to do the job the way that you want to do it. Entrepreneur, this was a really interesting one, as a lack of resource. Lack of entrepreneur means a lack of innovation, and a lack of human resource, a lack of creativity, and a lack and capital. That's obviously a lack of capital to re regularly inject into a business. So, again, a little exercise when you're starting out a business, um, particularly small companies, is how can you bootstrap? So bootstrapping means... Um, lift, literally lift, lifting yourself up by your own bootstraps. So doing the most possible with uh, the least amount of resources. And some little ideas I, I was thinking about, particularly, you know, we were talking about there not being enough uh, human resource in a company or one of the biggest problems that companies face is people working by themselves. You can start trying to build a team, perhaps by offering equity rather than cash. Um, and that's quite exciting and it also is, it's a good little test to see you know your vision um, your passion your drive can you enroll somebody into into what your belief is about this business and have them work for you know a final stake in the company and that actually will help you develop and build a team much more rapidly start really number two start really looking at your budget um, rather than what you wish for and start developing your plan around what actual budget you've got and again you'll need those financial systems in place to be able to keep a close eye on what your resources are where they're being spent and what's costing you where the leaks are another one i've done this quite a few times um, particularly in the early days of my company is asking for advance payments i, I typically now have a, a standard process where i always ask for 50 percent of um any stage fees up front and it's probably the first or second thing I say to a, uh, a prospective client and I often address it as like you know this doesn't work for anybody and will this be a problem for you I do charge 50% up front you know there's nothing it's it's you've got to be kind of up front with that from the beginning and flush it out early on but that really really helps by having because you do a lot of work um, chasing a client, winning a client, winning the work, and then to not get paid for all of that upfront work can sometimes be a little bit demotivating. So starting, starting a job, having 50% of your stage fees upfront in the bank, you can start allocating resources onto that project. It helps everything. It feels great. And it feels like, yes, we've started. Um, and you can, ask, you can ask clients even more. I know, I know people who um, have had entire payments paid up front. Um, again, that really helps your cash flow. And again, you can really kind of start getting aggressive with your business growth like that. So review your business model as well and start looking at where there are other streams of income that can be generated. I love talking to some of these guys on Instagram at the moment, recently interviewed um, Zine McFarlane, who's created a whole set of eBooks online and created a, you know, that's, that's simultaneously a marketing tool and an additional source of income, which is absolutely vital for him whilst he's developing his young practice 
And it's also serving as a way for him to generate ideas and for him to be thinking architecturally as well. So it's kind of really, you know, with social media and being kind of entrepreneurial in thought, looking at how you can monetize other parts of your business is really, really powerful. And finally, the last mistake that lots of architects make whilst running a business is being a generalist. So by being a generalist, what I mean is that you are something for everybody. You go onto your website and you might see some houses and then the museums and then you might see some installations and then you also see a bit of graphic design up there. Um, in certain, certain ways that can be coordinated and work, but generally uh, I would say from a marketing perspective that it's difficult. It's difficult to be a generalist unless you're perhaps, you know, you've got a very specific process and you can market and sell that. Um, you look at someone like, again, Rogers or Fosters, they're very much selling their process, but they've become specialists in a particular high tech form of architecture. So when you become a specialist, this is when you can really start to raise your fees. You're now uh, deemed an expert in your field and you can really start to enjoy what you're doing and get paid very well for it. So to give a couple of examples of this, if you go into uh, your, your store and you're looking for some kind of, uh, something for your, you've got a headache, right? You go, into, you go into a store and you're looking for a headache pill and if you just saw a big bottle of pills that said medicine on it for pain, okay, fair enough, that's quite general, but if you said, if you saw it, and this is what lots of the companies do, it's a specific medicine for temple headaches or something like that, or for migraines, ah, that's exactly what I need. You trust it more, and you can charge a higher amount of money for something like that. You see it with shampoos, you know, you've got shampoo for fine dry hair, you've got shampoo for, for blonde hair or, or whatever, or, and again, if you look at it in uh, the sense of... Um, like, like a surgeon, a surgeon is a specialist, a surgeon is able to command the highest fees in that profession. So how can you start to become a specialist in your area? I'd really start looking at your, the first thing you can do is start looking at your existing client list, um, look at the Pareto's principle, which is the 80-20 rule. Pareto was, he was an Italian economist, who noted uh, that 20% of people in Italy had 80% of the land in the country, and he found this trend to exist in other nations. And this kind of, um, this kind of, uh, what's the word, distribution of 80-20, you'll often find in all sorts of areas. Biologists have seen it in animal growth and, and in business, often 80% of your income and your revenue is coming from 20% of your clients. So the first thing to look at is to identify what is the 20% of your client base that's giving you 80% of your revenue. And I would start to look at who are they? Who are those people? What are those kinds of projects? And if they're the kind of project that you want to have more of, start niching down, start specializing, start getting really super specific in what it is that you're doing. You're no longer just an architect. You're an architect who's designing period Georgian properties for investment in West London. You know, um, I think in the design firm Accelerator, there's some really amazing exercises that go into a lot about how to really hone down your niche or hone down and become a specialist in, uh, in an area. So that's, I'm going to leave it there for you guys. Um, thank you very much. I know there's probably going to be some, some um, questions. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan, for that awesome 10 mistakes. Ryan, just run us through the list again, because I'm sure people were taking notes. They might have missed a few. Run through them just very quickly. What are the 10 business mistakes so, we talked about so, today that you identified? So number one is no company vision. Number two is working in the business and not on the business. Number three is no systems for lead generation or referrals. Number four, 
is no financial systems. Number five is doing it alone, working alone. Number six is selling features and benefits and not selling the problem you solve for your client. Number seven is working for free. Number eight is complaining. Number nine is lack of resources. And number 10 is being a generalist. Awesome. Thanks for that, Ryan. So for those of you, thank you everyone for joining us today. We will be sending out a PDF file that has a summary of those things as well as a link to the recording. But before we jump out here, I just want to ask you a question. Would you like to know, would anyone like to know how me and my team, how our team can help you grow a more profitable, hyper profitable and super impactful practice? If so, I'll, I'll give you one next step you can take. Just let me know. Otherwise, we'll go right into questions. Okay, cool. So I'll show you the options we have here. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, this will come through. Let's do this. Share screen. I see Rashmi's here. Thanks, Rashmi, for coming. Yeah. All right. Look, so I, I subscribe to the tripartite model of practice uh, management, basically dividing up. You can look at a, a professional services firm, an architectural firm, and divide it up into three major areas. So we have sales and marketing, which is basically getting the work. We have number two, the finance and support, which is everything that needs to happen to make sure the work gets done. And then there at the bottom, we have professional services, which is of course, delivering what we're licensed to do as architects, the drawings, the professional services that we offer. So we have getting the work, we have delivering the work, and we have supporting the work to make sure it gets done correctly. Now, all of these things are equally important. Without one of them, the whole practice collapses. And in your firm, you may be stronger in one area than in others. Now, in my experience and Ryan's experience, we found that practices basically uh, are struggling in two areas or some of the challenges they're having are in two areas. One of those areas is sales and marketing, and the other area is the back office kind of operations of the firm, the systemization and the processes in the firm. So these two options would be, look, you're either struggling with marketing and sales, you need more consistent clients, better projects, or perhaps... Uh, you have a flood of clients and products right now, but it just feels like your hair is on fire. You're running from problem to problem on the hamster wheel, and you want to build a real business asset. So what I'm going to offer to those of you who are on the call today is a opportunity to hop on the phone with either me or one of my team, and we'll talk you through it. It's about a 60-minute call, and we're going to diagnose what your business challenge is right now. So like I said, it may be marketing and sales. On the other hand, it may be the systemization of the firm. And during this call, you'll get some major breakthroughs about what you can do to grow your firm or to systematize it so that you don't have to run around. So you can start to move into that business owner category and then eventually into the investor category that Ryan talked about with this cash flow quadrant. So if you go to this link right here that you see on the screen, you'll be able to book a call right on my calendar. It's about a 60 minute call. And like I said, this, this is a conversation Well, I'm going to add either me or one of my team is going to ask you some questions about your business and about where you want to get to. And we're going to give you some recommendations based upon our experience of working with firms just like yours. So let me tell you quickly who this is for and who this is not for. So if you're an employee and you don't currently have a firm, this is not for you. This is for business owners who are ready and willing to move ahead and grow their business in one way shape or form. If you find that you always have an excuse for why things aren't working in your life, if you came to this presentation thinking that you already know everything that Ryan has talked about, which you may, uh, but you haven't implemented it, then this, this is not for you. This is for people who have an open mind who are looking for every single advantage they can find to get ahead in their practice. And like I said, uh, when you go to this link, you'll just be able to book directly on my calendar for a 60-minute one-on-one conversation. So that is businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 
call. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. Thank you again for listening. And don't forget that those early bird tickets for the next Business of Architecture UK live event are now on sale. And you can get those by booking online in the link that's in the information of this podcast. Look forward to seeing you there.